This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I follow Mark Andreessen on Twitter. Mark, one of the founders of Netscape, going back to the Mosaic browser. I love his thinking. I want to have him on my podcast at some point in the future. This summer, he tweeted about a professor, Joel Mokier, at Northwestern. And Andreessen said that he was one of his heroes. Joel Mokier was one of Mark Andreessen's heroes. That intrigued me. Joel Mokier is a economic historian at Northwestern University. His big thing is technology, technological progress, how it affects growth. And from Joel's perspective, we've not seen anything yet. Yes, I understand that many will say the quality of life for some, perhaps they would argue for many, has dropped. And technology has not helped in the growth statistics. It doesn't show up in the economic statistics. Joel has a different perspective. And once again, from his perspective, we've not seen anything yet when it comes to technology. And what I really like about Joel, he's not trying to predict what will come next. He knows he can't. But he's ready and he's confident that big things will continue to happen. A fun, interesting conversation. I hope you enjoy. Only my undergraduates call me professor. <laughs> you sound too old to be an undergraduate. Come on, I'm only 19. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I'm 27. <laughs> oh, man. How are was, was things in Saigon? They're, they're nice. You know, I, I've, I've told many people when I do this podcast, you know, I came to Asia on a speaking tour in early 2013 for four months for a bank, and uh, then I couldn't leave. So, really? So now I'm here, uh, and it's very normal to me now. How long are you there for? Well, I've been here for going on two years now. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I came here the first month of January 13, and it'll be two years come the new year. Oh, you speak Vietnamese? No, my girlfriend's a little mad about that as of right now. Because you know what's bad is you, you can get by with English across Asia, so you don't feel the imperative. But uh, for social interactions, I need to put my foot down and, and really start to do it. Is your girlfriend Vietnamese? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, that explains something. Is she from there? Is she from Saigon? She's from the countryside, but she's lived in Saigon for like 10 years. So, And I, I, t- I tell people, because I've traveled like 10 countries in Asia, the most beautiful women are easily in Vietnam. And, and I've not found a male yet that disagrees with that idea. It's funny. I've ne- we, I have never been there. And now you really raise in me the sort of desire to go there on my next trip to the Far East. It still has some innocence to it, which is nice. Yeah, that's right. I, we, we just came back from Kuala Lumpur and from Singapore and whatever else you can say about these towns, but innocence is not quite the first thing that comes to mind. No, there's, and you know, unfortunately, I think they're, you know, they're building skyscrapers and a new subway into Saigon. So, you know, the innocence, hopefully it won't go away anytime soon, but, uh, Prosperity, come, you know, that's what comes with prosperity. The probably economy is probably doing fairly well. Well, it's a merchant class for sure. I mean, everyone is selling something, so it's in their it's in their blood. They want to get ahead. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Let me jump right in. I think it would be great, given your background, to define technology. And I think I think also as you define technology, you know, there's there's critics out there say, hey, technology it alters everything, it plays God. But the reality, without technology, we'd still be hunters and gatherers. Like not very good ones, hmm. because even hunters and gatherers used bows and arrows and you know and and crude. Uh, sticks and stuff like that. That's technology in a way. So no, no, no. I mean, the notion that we're playing God by using technology, uh, it's always struck me as sort of ridiculous. Of course we're playing God. We're supposed to. Uh, we are the species that alters its environment more efficiently 
than any other species on this planet. We're not the only one. Beavers, of course, do so, and some others do. But we are much more deliberate and much more eff effective at that. And in so doing, you know, we create a better world for ourselves. We have become the dominant species on this planet. And, you know, and, 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 and whether you like that or not, it's, 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 a, it's a fact of life. We have been that for God knows how long. And, of course, what's been made that possible is it's not just technology, but the technology has been an absolutely intrinsic part of it. It's basically the, expo the, the definition is straightforward, which is we are exploiting natural regularities and uh, laws uh, in order to improve our material existence. That's basically what it is. And, you know, material existence broadly defined, so it's not just putting food on the table and clothes on our body, but also going from here to there or, you know, avoiding disease, fighting other species that are, that are trying to do us ill, um, protecting ourselves from, you know, cold and heat and, 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 and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's basically material, our material existence broadly defined. That's, that's what technology is. And it's neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, as a famous economist once said. Let me follow up on that. The reason I reached out to you originally was I saw the Wall Street Journal piece with your, with your colleague, uh, Robert Gordon. And, and essentially, you know, he, he was taking, he takes the stance that, hey, w our, our best days are not ahead of us. I'm paraphrasing. And you would say, hey, hold on. Our best days are ahead of us, meaning there's going to be so much innovation that we can't even imagine. And he's kind of, he's saying, well, hold on. No, 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 no. Why don't you talk about why and how you've become so fascinated, so your career, the idea of technological progress, technology, economic growth, these things are intertwined for you. And you don't see any slowdown in that at all, do you? Well, I see no technological reasons for a slowdown. I am worried about some things. I'm worried about politics. I'm worried about institutions. You know, I'm worried about a, a, a variety of things that can go wrong. I don't think we are smarter than, you know, the, gen the generations that lived, you know, at the time of Julius Caesar in terms of our intelligence. We're just better organized uh, to do uh, technology. But that organization can fall apart. It has repeatedly threatened to fall apart and could fall fall apart again for a variety of reasons. But in terms of our capability of uh, creating new technology, I think we are just, you know, embarking on a, a new page in history that makes everything else that came before look like 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 trivial. I mean, I, it's not just that the best is still ahead of us, Mike. It's we ain't seen nothing yet. Hmm. Uh, you just. Look around you and you see what the capabilities uh, are and the many directions that we could be going. Uh, and you realize that everything that came before was just kind of, you know, groping. And now we actually have a much better sense of uh, what we can do to the, our environment and to nature around us and how we can manipulate and control it for our own purposes in the process. We continuously screw up. Okay, that has to be put right cent front and center. Okay, we screw up. We screw up because we have to. We can't, there's no other way of doing technology because if we knew everything, then it wouldn't be new. So we don't. We we go into terra incognita. We go places that we don't know what's going to happen. And so in the process, we get it sometimes right and sometimes we get it wrong. And usually we're a little bit of both. And so we screw up. We, we you know we cause environmental damage or we you know we. We, we harm something and then we have to fix it. And then more technology comes around that fixes it. And then that, that could screw up things, some, some things some more. So it's not all rosy. I am not one of those sort of starry-eyed optimists who think this, you know, uh, uh, the millennium is upon us. Quite to the contrary. But my fundamental point is that our capabilities have improved so much that we will be able to do in 20 or 30 years things that are just quite unimaginable today in a whole range of areas that at the moment still seem completely either you know, science fiction or, or completely insane. And I think that's... Um, I can see 
from, you know, uh, in, in, in 50. Here, here's a good thought experiment that I make my students do, okay? I say, you know, imagine somebody born in, say, 1780, so smack in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, and then try to imagine what that person would think of technology if they were transplanted to 2014. And uh, they would be far more bewildered by what they see about things that happened, say, 20, uh, 200 years later, than what they would have seen if you transported them back in time a thousand years. Okay, So the rate of change, say, between the year 800 AD and 1800 AD uh, is much, much smaller than what it became later on. And I think that's the, that acceleration is the sort of central fact that uh, that drives my, my thinking about this. Let me bring up an issue that I thought was really interesting in your work. So you're, you, the critics out there would say, say, hold on, growth is slowing. And but you you would argue, hold on, maybe we need to look at new ways of measuring growth. I would love for you to talk about these examples, because I saw you a simple example, antibiotics and anesthesia. You know, two things that have changed our world, but they don't show up in the GDP figures, do they really? Not really, no. I mean, they're too small just to count for anything. And yet, would we, would we live without them? Of course not. But I'll give you an even better example, Mike, which is what, I'm, what, I, what, I, what I like to use. Think about one of the banes of, of modern existence, which we would all like to do without, which is... Uh, traffic jams and commuting costs. Okay, so the cost of commuting, if you measure it correctly, which is you take all the number of hours that people sit in commuting, and and uh, multiply by some by some shadow price of their time, you come up with a very substantial number. Now the way that that number is basically counted in the national income accounts as leisure. Now nobody thinks they're having a good time when they're sitting in a traffic jam. You know, on the Kennedy Expressway here in Chicago or anywhere, you know, anywhere else, but that's how it's counted. Now, suppose, which is right, right on our doorstep, that we will be able to cut commuting time and costs by two thirds by, say, having driverless cars, which basically solve the problem of traffic jams. Say, now this would be a vast improvement in the existence of, you know. Tens of millions of people all over the world, not just in, in the United States, but in other places where there are traffic jams. I mean, I don't know how bad things are in Saigon, but I can tell you how bad they are in Tel Aviv. And so, would that ever show up in the national income account? And the answer is no, it wouldn't, because this, you know, this is just basically changing from one form of leisure to another, and that the national income accounts don't take that into account. So you see what I'm saying? I mean, there are many of the major things that I see ahead of us, uh, the national income accounting procedures that Gordon and others are, are, are using, and I myself, we all use them, okay? But they're not built for an economy that is a sort of high-tech knowledge economy that we're living in. And he, he, here's another thing to think about, okay? The way national income accounts are set up, is we measure things, we aggregate things by prices. And so somehow we we that build, build on the assumption that these prices reflect something close to the cost of production, okay? And so they basically reflect the inputs that went into into making that, you know, box of cereal that you've just bought. And for boxes of cereals, the system works quite well. The problem in a, in a knowledge-based economy is that the marginal cost of making anything that's knowledge-related is practically zero. Mm. Okay, we ch now people charge for it, but they charge for it because they can, not because it costs them anything, and because they got to co cover their overhead. But the actual cost of producing that extra unit is essentially zero, and so prices become rather arbitrary. And in many cases, the competitive system basically drives them down to nothing. I am now speaking with somebody half a globe away <laughs> uh, and have been for 15.20, 15 minutes and 20 seconds. For free. <laughs> it hasn't cost either one of us a penny. 
Has it? No. Now, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in 1950, this cost would have already been <laughs> bankrupted us because yeah. it would be so good. The cost is zero. Now, don't tell me that this is not a service that we both appreciate and like. And yet, in terms of national income accounting, we haven't done anything. Now, these are just examples I'm picking, but you see where, 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 where I'm going with this, okay? Bob and uh, all national income accounting have, are working with a system that was designed by an, what I call a wheat and steel economy, okay? An economy that made agricultural and manufactured products in which, in which prices reflected costs. We are no longer living in a society in which wheat and steel are really important components of our, our total production, it's a lot of it is information or information related things. And there the whole system I think completely breaks down. And so my sense is that all of those people who, who are obsessed with growth and things that are derived from growth, so for instance, Bob will talk a great deal about uh, uh, total factor productivity, uh, which is an important, or, or labor productivity. I mean, you take the GDP and you divide it into something, which is, you know, which are reasonably good things to do if you're comparing 2012 with 2013. But they're not very good if you're going to compare 1980 with 2014, and even less good if you think what's happening, say, 24, in 2030 compared to 2014. Okay, and that, and that I think is is fundamentally my my complaint against all those people who are sitting there and worrying about worrying about growth. I mean, look, you can today buy. I just read this Friday in the paper. You can buy the new smartphone put out by Amazon for ninety nine cents. Now you lock yourself into a contract, but but still, is it really worth ninety nine cents? <laughs> we, I, I, I don't know if it's answers yes or no. The answer is we should we should completely design a new system of accounting and calculation that tries to take into account new products, new services that are part of an information economy in which uh, costs aren't you know don't mean what they used to mean. You know, I'm sitting here trying to be on the other side, maybe put my shoes, put myself in Bob's shoes. So what, what, what is his, when you just, when you just describe the situation, like, you, you know, look, it's very difficult to value some of these great benefits that we have, like a Skype conversation. When you bring up those types of things, what do folks on the other side, did they say, because I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm having a really difficult time trying to figure out where you're wrong on this particular issue. I can't see it. <laughs> I like the subtext of your question. But right? what do they say when they? What do they say when you bring this up? So here is what they say. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to make that. Up. And the argument is essentially: look, it's true that anesthesia and antibiotics and things like that have created a great deal more economic well-being than their impact on on, on national income seems to suggest. Okay, so the, the, the technical term for that is consumer surplus, basically. So you were better off than. Uh, what we're paying for uh, that's essentially or how or how, we how much we would be willing to pay for it if it if it did, wasn't there right so anesthesia is a sort of classic example but uh, you know, lots of examples that we can think of but he would say but that's always been the case it's throughout the 20th century people got all kind of things that improved their lives in terms of you know medical care but all the things that you know He's sort of fascinated by the by the home, so air conditioning and running water and you know flush toilets and that kind of thing. I mean that that seems to be uppermost on his mind. And he says, you know, so we had that in the 20th century, and he says we, we're never going to be able to to do anything quite as drastic for improvement of human life than that than than these things have already taken place. And so it's basically an argument about, well, you know, the, the low-hanging fruits, which is, you know, uh, climate control and, 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 and sanitation and things like that, have already been picked. The new things that are on the horizon will never quite improve our lives as much as that. My argument against that is we don't know. Mm. Because I can see a world in which... 
life expectancy easily starts hitting the three the, the triple digits. And not only that, but in which medical science will be able to slow down the various degenerative processes that make our bodies go bad when we grow old and our minds go bad. Uh, research is happening on all those fronts. There, there have been breakthroughs, not the big breakthroughs we were hoping for, but that, that'll come. And so I think it betrays a certain lack of imagination, that you cannot imagine anything quite as you know, dramatic as, say, air conditioning on the quality of life. But, but I think the larger picture is really, and that's where the, I think the uh, methodological difference uh, comes in, is that, that Bob is still strongly committed to the old paradigm in which, you know, the uh, GDP is still the gospel, and it's still the numbers that you really put more credence. And everybody who teaches this stuff says, well, you know, you should really be very careful about equating GDP with any kind of economic welfare, but, and then we then go, go ahead and do it anyway. I, I'm the same way, I do it. But the truth of the matter is that for predictions about the future, uh, it's not just that, that, it's, that it's incorrect, but it is becoming increasingly incorrect as time elapses, yeah. because we're moving more and more from a wheat and steel economy into an sort of information economy. Let, let, let me give you one example of or, uh, where I think his lack of imagination really shows. So, I need to take a step back for this, Mike, but I'll explain it in a minute. So, I spent my life essentially studying economic history, and in particular focusing on the Industrial Revolution. And uh, one of the big things that the Industrial Revolution did was it created what we call the factory system, right? So, before 1750, say, almost all production of any kind took place in people's homes. No, nobody worked anywhere that wasn't his home. I mean, you know, artisans and manufacturers had a little workshop next to their house, and of course farmers worked out in the fields, but the fields were adjacent to their homes, and, you know, merchants had a little shop, and they lived usually above it. So everybody worked from home, and their main employees, if they had any, were their family members or their apprentices, but, but people who were part of their household. So the, this, the current separation between firm and household didn't exist. And what the Industrial Revolution did, and Karl Marx and what people pointed this out at great, at great detail, is it basically separated the household from the firm. Okay? So now you live at home, you consume at home, but you produce and work somewhere else. And that somewhere else puts certain constraints on you. You come there at, you know, whatever, 8.30, you work until 5, five days a week, and you get a week vacation, and basically the rest of the time is supposed to be there, and everything's regimented. That's how the world emerged in the, you know, two decades after the Industrial Revolution. And uh, that's had huge effects on human welfare in many ways, some of it good, some of it bad, but basically it created the commute, it created factory discipline, it created all kinds of things that people didn't know before. And my sense is that that, that uh, a pendulum is swinging now back in the other direction. People can work at their own time from their own homes, if they so choose, or from any other place that they uh, choose to work in. And I can really see a world, and not that far away, in which the notion that you actually go to work, and you take your car in the morning and drive off to the office or the factory, that that is going to become a, a minority phenomenon. I don't think it will ever go away altogether, but I think it will become a minority phenomenon. More and more people will be able to work at the times that they choose from the places that they do. Now, that's not necessarily going to be uh, <laughs> impacting the national income account in any sort of obvious, predictable way, but it's going to be a huge change in the way we live. You know, it's funny. I, I've, I've lived that way, what you described, either working from home or a hotel or on the road. or I've worked that way since 1995. Yeah, I worked that way since, <laughs> since 1974. I'm a college professor. I go in when I feel like it, and I don't go in when I don't feel like it. But you, but but you still have to go to school, and, and you have to I go to the to school exactly the times when I teach ah. and when I have a faculty meeting. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the time, I get up whenever I want. Now, of course, if 
And, and that may change, by the way. It may well be the case that in, in 20 years, my job will consist in sitting here in front of a screen and having 25 students sitting in front of their screens, and that's how I teach. We may no longer have to all meet in a classroom. I mean, we may prefer to do it that way. There seems to be something about human physical presence which is hard to substitute for. I agree. And so, agree. I, I, so, I, so I don't think it will disappear altogether, but I, I, I surely think that the five days a week sort of eight to five routine will be very seriously changed. And it may well be that, that meetings and face-to-face -face contact will no longer take place somewhere in a centralized office or factory, but they could take place in a park or in a cafe. And, you know, we meet for lunch and then we both go our, our different ways. And then the next day we, we follow up by talking on Skype or sending emails or, you know, whatever the mode of communication will be. Um, and so it, it it, it will not be altogether an improvement because I don't actually think that these changes always sort of tie together the good and the bad, right? So uh, it may well be that we, it will be very convenient to work from home. I don't have to put on a tie. I don't have to spend all day in a cubicle. I don't have to fight traffic. But I'll miss the water cooler effect. We're kind of talking about the death of distance. And I'm thinking about technology. And I'm like, and, and living in this part of the world, boy, if technology can solve the language issue before we have to learn all of the languages. Now, that would never show up in the, in the GDP stats either, but boy, could that change the world in a dramatic and drastic way, literally overnight, if language has no friction. I'm not sure what you mean by, you mean different languages. Right, mean meaning, like if, meaning if, if, if language is no longer an obstacle in any way, shape, or form, and everyone can communicate, and technology solves that. That's an interesting, an interesting. I hadn't thought about that actually. Uh, we already have uh, cut down the cost of translating things uh, because we have better and better machines that can do it. It's still not perfect. If you ever use Google Translate, you know that. But right, right. It's, it's a lot better than it used to be, and you can sort of see how they will gradually. Uh, 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 get the bugs out, just as they did with, say, computers playing chess or things like that. Uh, and so that would that would be a, a, a absolutely a major thing. I, I think it, it's part an interesting interaction between technology in which translation can be, can occur simultaneous, but also the fact that because we are all part of a globalized world that create, that technology has created, the need for a lingua franca has become uh, ever more biting and. Um, in that sense, the choice of the lingua franca is a bit arbitrary. So medieval and Renaissance Europe, for instance, had a lingua franca called Latin. In the 18th century, French became the lingua franca. Everybody spoke French, wrote in French, read French. And then in the uh, late 19th, uh, early 20th century, slowly English replaced French to the uh, everlasting chagrin of the French. Uh, and, and now it's English. And so you told me yourself I mean, half an hour ago that you're living in this town in which is Vietnamese speaking, but you're managing quite well with English. And, you know, and I travel a lot and I, and I go to lots of countries. Now I speak a few languages, but, but my French isn't great. And I can manage these days in Paris with English. And, uh, and you go to places like the Netherlands or Israel, where I do speak the language as it happens, but, but, but everybody speaks English. And, every, and you, know, you go to Scandinavia, Germany, all over the place, and English has become the lingua franca. And I think that is in large part uh, uh, driven by technology, because everybody watches movies and television and, and on and on and on. And the Internet has played an important role, because the Internet, too, is roughly speaking done in English. I had a mainland Chinese guide last year, and he was from Shanghai, and he had an associate from down close to Shenzhen near Hong Kong, and he told me that they both spoke Chinese, but it was different dialects, so they literally could not communicate. So these two Chinese guys had to speak English to communicate. Absolutely. And if you know what? If you see a Swede speaking to a Finn, they will speak English as well, even though the countries are next door to each other. It's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah, and German, and in the EU, you know, German Germans speak to to, to 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 the French. They speak in English, and the funny thing is in Belgium, because in Belgium, of course, half the population is Flemish speaking, the other half is French speaking. But when they speak to each other these days, they speak in English. You know, Silicon Valley is like America's shining light of innovation, and everyone. Not everyone, but I think a lot of people really look up to around the world, and there's so much innovation comes out of that that fairly small pocket uh, of people in geography. 
But innovation, and I think I've seen you say this, is is not it's not natural for us. So I, I would love for you to maybe talk about innovation not being natural. The idea that it's an acquired skill to be disrespectful, to step aside and say that the institutions maybe need a little critical thought, a little little opposition research. Maybe inspire my audience to think about standing outside because literally it's not a choice today. We we all have to be outside the box. Even if you don't think you are or, or you don't want to be, if you really want to survive and have an interesting life, you have to be. You have to you have to get this skill to be disrespectful. Talk about this. Inspire my audience. What I find most interesting is that in the 21st century, the amount of respect we have for the writings and learning of previous generation is at a lower level than it has ever been in the history of mankind. That basically anything that's in, in, in almost any field of knowledge uh, that's more than 10 years old, nobody even looks at anymore. I mean, that stuff is just out of date, it's just obsolete. Now, think about this in, with a histor- think about this in a historical perspective, you know, just go bonkers. I mean, what society ever was like that? You know, for thousands of years, whether you were a medieval monk or whether you were a Jewish rabbi or a, a you know, an, an, an Islamic scholar, you know, the word of the past was sacrosanct. I mean, you wanted to know what was true. You looked it up in the Talmud or in Aristotle or in, you know, the Quran or wherever. Confucius, everybody looked at the past and assumed that the wisdom of the past was so towering and so overwhelming that if you just, if you didn't know the answer, you hadn't looked long, hard enough and you go back to these old books and, and find the answer. And at some point in history, and I sort of have, my new book is all about that actually, at some point in history, somebody or a number of people in located in Europe, okay, basically said, you know what? These old guys, they're full of shit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because it's true, Aristotle said there can be no such thing as a vacuum, right? That's what he says. And then people go and they build a machine that sucks the air out of the cylinder and they create a vacuum. And they say, well, you know, look what, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, you know, I can give, I can give you 50 examples like that. Okay? But basically, the notion is... Uh, don't take anybody's word or and knowledge is and this is a, a term I like all knowledge is contestable and challengeable and we do we continue doing that there are no sacred cows you know Newton was a sacred cows for 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 you know a centuries and then the guys came around and say you know what this isn't quite right and Einstein came around but even today people are more than willing to say well you know if Einstein could have been wrong I don't think there is anybody today that we regard as essentially a gospel and I think that is the hallmark of modern society but what is really I think striking is how unusual that is and that's why I'm so optimistic because. We are basically willing to shrug off the knowledge of ancient learnings. I mean, think how many students today finish the university who never read any any classics. In economics, we don't even teach the history of economic thought. I mean, when I was an undergraduate, we still had to take study Adam Smith and Ricardo and all these guys writing writing in the 18th and 19th century. And I still do because it's what this is sort of my specialty. But the truth is that we are today, you know, giving PhDs in economics to guys who've never read The Wealth of Nation. And they've never, let alone, they've never read Capital, they've never read John Stuart Mill, they've never read Keynes, they've never read any of these guys. It's all obsolete. In physics, in medicine, it, it's true everywhere. We have essentially decided that we are smarter than any generation that came before us. The, the, the exception to some extent, of course, are philosophers. But even there, you can see this sort of slowly. Uh, in, in history, it's the same thing, by the way. It's, it's true everywhere. We are, you, know, you could call this arrogance. I mean, people have called it arrogance. And it's basically saying, look, you know, we are smarter than anybody who came before us. Now, reaching that state of mind took hundreds of years because it's not natural for us. It's natural for us to look with great 
veneration at the past and say, oh my God, look here, when you want to know what was true, go read, re go read your Bible. Go read your Confucius or your Zhu Qi or you know, any of these uh, ancient learned. I mean, we Jews, uh, we were the worst of them all. I mean, we basically said all the wisdom of the past has been revealed to our forefathers, first in the five books of the Torah, then in the other books of the Bible, and then in the Mishnah and the Talmud. Okay? And the rest is basically exegesis, it's, it's interpretation. And so Jews didn't produce anything useful for, for, for thousands of years until about, uh, until that point which came around the so late 18th, early 19th century, in which they said, you know what? This old stuff is wrong. We're going to start new things. And all of a sudden the Jews produced Einstein and Freud and Marx and, you know, you name it. But that took them a long time, before 1800. You're not going to find anybody among the Jews who produces anything worthwhile because they all think, hey, the wisdom is contained in the writings of the past. That, I think, is, <laughs> is, is, is really an amazing step that mankind has made, and that's mm. really new, which is why I think the past is a very bad guide for the future. We are a different, we have created a different culture in which you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not just we're all standing outside the box. There is no box. Hmm. Yeah, and that, I mean, and I think for some people that can be uh, downright frightening and scary. Uh, I think it's the most exciting thing that, that that could happen in my lifetime, and I feel fortunate to have grown up in the internet as a guy in his forties. And I, I just, I think there can be nothing more exciting that there's no box, and that you you can literally just wake up. Anybody can wake up and just say, "I'm going to be the next, who the next Silicon Valley." You know, superstar. Anybody can do it, and it it really comes down to effort, motivation, drive, and uh, all these things. The to being blessed or ordained, a, as in centuries past, they're not there anymore. The friction's gone away. It's up to you, and if you want to do it, you can do it. I'm scared myself. You know, I'm, I'm after all, I'm in my sixties. You know, so you know, as you grow older, the your ability to adapt to new things does go down. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very happy to do Skype and email, but I don't have a Facebook page and I don't do Twitter and I'm sure there are things like Instagram and, and, and things like that that I should be doing that I don't do. You know, you get somehow set in your ways. And in fact, the, the, the one of the reasons I worry about this thing, and I said many of I worry, is because as man, as the human race gets richer and, and more sophisticated, you know, the population will get older on average because we live longer. And that means that the proportion of guys in my in my cohort is going to increase, and these people have a harder time dealing with change than others. So there's a built-in tendency for society to become more conservative simply as the average age goes up because so much of the innovation and the sort of freshness and the rebelliousness comes from people in their late teens and 20s. And their number in the population... Uh, their proportion of population is going to decrease. So that's something that, uh, one of the many things that I worry about. But, you know, who knows? Hey, I tell you, if people want that youth, though, uh, countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, 50% of the populations of these countries are below the age of 30. This isn't Japan. <laughs> no, no, it isn't Japan. It isn't China. These countries still had, had high birth rates in the past. But that, too, by the way, is coming down these days. And mm -hmm. I can see in 50 years... The entire planet will get will start getting older real fast. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at what's happening, even in some in, in some countries where you'd think it wouldn't happen, you know, one of the most amazing things what's happened in Iran. You look at Iran, you say, "Oh my God, a theocracy, very religious, blah 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 blah." Their fertility rates are have been falling like a rock. I mean, they are below replacement fertility. Mm -hmm. They are going to be in fifty years. Iran will be a country of old men and mm -hmm. women. Think mm -hmm. about it. I think that maybe happened, it, you know, it hasn't happened in, the only place where it's actually not at all happening yet is in Africa. But even there, I, I think, you know, give, give them enough time, it will. And so, there's nothing wrong with being, you know, a planet of, of, of relative people in there, you know, where the median age is, is, is 40. But it may affect things uh, somewhat unexpectedly. I mean, yeah. on the other hand, Perhaps we will find a way of changing the way people think so that this sort of built-in conservatism can be slowed down. Who knows? 
Absolutely. And I think that's that's your that's your whole point. We just don't know. And I think you just we're just going to continue to see technological advances and we just don't know what's going to happen. I just got to tell you this. Hmm. I was watching yesterday. I was uh, my wife found this. Actually. She sent it to me yesterday for the first time. <laughs> somebody in Chicago actually drove a car that was entirely built through three dimensional printers. Wow. Really? In 44 hours, they built a car from scratch, from nothing but sort of carbon fiber raw materials, and they had this heavy-duty three-dimensional printer. Well, it's not really a printer at all. It's essentially a manufacturing machine. And they built the car from scratch, from nothing. And and at the end of the process, the guy drove it out of the factory. Yeah. Wow. It's, I mean, it, it essentially... We are moving to a sort of mass customization society in which the whole manufacturing system of the, of the world will be will be uh, completely overall. I mean, this is a an, an industrial revolution. You know, for you and you and I and everybody else, uh, we have rarely ever purchased anything uh, that was manufactured, custom made for us. Right? You go to an automobile dealership or you buy a can of tomato sauce. I mean, there are. Millions exactly like it that were being made. And in some sense, that's good because you know something about the quality and so on and so forth. But the notion that you could actually sit at home and basically push a bunch of buttons and print out your own new shirt exactly the way you like it uh, without having to go to the shop and without having anybody else you know, make it for you, that that really does, does ring in a new epoch, don't you think? It's pretty wild. It is. It's. It's pretty. That's all you can say, right? It's pretty wild. <laughs> it's not just your shirt, you know. I, I can. I can imagine having a little machine at home and I push a button and it produces a breakfast cereal that I want. I don't have to go to the to Trader Joe and, and and pick a pack. I just design my own. I mean, that is actually on the horizon. Yeah. And here's one more thing that I that I mentioned there, but that I. What is happening in material science, okay, which is not used, usually people focus always on information and communication technology. It's always sort of a, a digital and, and stuff like that. Now, I see the importance. But what is happening in material science, remember, uh, Mike, that we define ages by the main material on which, from which they make things. Right? So we have the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Stone Age. These were things that we learned to use, but they were already there. We are now making man-made materials that we can design from scratch. I mean, talking about playing God. I mean, these are things that nature never could have imagined. The ceramics and plastics and, you know, carbon fibers. And you, you, you name it. I mean, it, it, we, it is not, we don't have an experiment. We design them in silico. We designed them on a computer screen. I think I heard something. The new, the new Apple Watch has got a surface that's only second to a diamond surface, and it's some type of synthetic that they created. I know. I yeah. saw that. Yeah. And this is going to change our lives more than anybody can imagine, okay? So it's not indoor plumbing, because we already have that. <laughs> but it's different, you know, and it's, it'll change our life in ways that, you know, we cannot imagine any more than somebody in 1914 can Im could imagine the internet. I mean, people ask me, what kind of jobs will we have if we if we now have computers that replace people? And what I say to them is, look, you can't imagine the job that we'll have in the future any more than if you start sitting in 1914 on the eve of World War One, okay? And you told somebody, hey, you know what? Your, your great grandson is going to be a video game designer, and they'd look at you and say, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Or, you know, a cybersecurity expert. Well, I mean, see, try to explain to somebody in 1914 what a cybersecurity expert does. Yeah. If I even look back to when, let's say, Netscape hit, I think they, they went public in the summer of 1995. And, and that was, that was truly exciting. That was like, wow. Okay. You, everyone just, you didn't know where it was all going to go, but you knew we were embarking on something that was opening up a whole new, a whole new way. Absolutely. And, and, and yet in 1985, so 10 years earlier, you, nobody had an inkling that this was coming. No, not at all. Nobody had an inkling. And that's, that's, that's my whole point. But 
You know, not even three, not even in three years before that, really. In 1992, I was in a graduate program. Nobody was talking about the internet in 1992. Nobody. I mean, it was, it was that quick. It was, it was that quick. And even, even then, you know, people thought it would, it would have a very limited, it would have a very limited use in which you could perhaps get some news, you could get some information. But the notion that you could actually order a movie and and watch that movie five seconds later, or that you could do all your shopping online, uh, is uh, let alone manufacture things. I mean that, that that would have been complete unthinkable. And um, and 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 my sense that is the kind, the way you should think about the future. You should just admit our own incapability of imagining it. But the only thing you, you the best thing you can do is think about the preconditions that. Uh, uh, that that uh, release the constraints of things that we've been able to do, and there I think uh, history is really helpful because it is, as I point out in these articles, uh, 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 we have developed tools and instruments and machinery and equipment to manipulate nature and understand it in ways that would have been that, that are completely uh, uh, sea changes compared to what we had before. And it's not just a computer. It's techniques that would have been unimaginable. Uh, you know, I, I talked to, I mentioned material science. The other thing that I think that people don't fully realize how big it's going to be, although you know, a few people who, who do it know, is, uh, is genetic modification. Mm. And we will talk about playing God. Mm. I mean, we are going to create new species, life forms, both plants and animals, that that, that that will be unimaginable compared to what we had before. It's not just, you know. I'll, sh I'll share with you a fun story. A couple of years ago, I was down visiting a friend, hedge fund manager, and his brother worked with horses, and uh, he was doing a lot of uh, uh, cloning and whatnot. And uh, they had a champion cutter horse, and they knew it was dying. And so they took they took the sample, and they, they froze it. They didn't have the technology at that time. They cloned that horse a couple of years later, and it was the exact, I mean, not the exact, you don't necessarily know what's going on in the mind, but it was the same horse. And I, I remember looking at him, and, you know, this was down in, in, in Texas, and uh, he was a very bright guy, very, very uh, sophisticated, but, you know, he was, he was dressed as a cowboy. And I looked at him and I said, I said, hey, if you can do this with horses right now, I said, this is going on with people right now, too, isn't it? No one's just talking about it, right? And, he said, and he's like, I think he spit some tobacco out, and he looked at me and he goes, oh, yeah, they're doing it right now with people. So, I mean, you're right. Who knows what's going on exactly? Who knows where all these advances are going to go for either good or bad? And some, and some of it will be bad. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, and, but the problem is these are all genies that come out of a bottle and mm -hmm. once they're out, you can't put them back again. So, you know, we have, you know, n nuclear weapons that would, perhaps it would be better if we didn't know how to make them, but now we do and mm -hmm. there they are. And um, lots of other things that, that, that we may want to, we're happy with. But there they are. And so my sense is you can't stop it. But progress comes with cost. It comes with pain. It comes with disruptions. But boy, it beats stagnation. I mm. know stagnant societies. I, I've studied them. But my God, they're, they're terrible places. You wouldn't want to live in medieval Europe. There, there. I think, I think that that sums it all up for for all those folks that want to say technology has its uh, its weaknesses and its disadvantages. You wouldn't want to live in medieval Europe. There you go, right there. <laughs> hey, Joel, Joel, what's the where's the best place for people that may not have heard of your work? I mean, they can go to Amazon and check out your books. But is there is there a particular website that we can send them to? Your homepage at Northwestern. I have a homepage at Northwestern. It isn't quite as up to date as it should be because I never find the time to do so. And our system isn't all that user friendly. But hey, anybody who wants more details can always email me, and uh, I have a bunch of articles that 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 uh, incorporate some of the things that, that we talked about today that I, that, are, that have come out recently. So I can send them to them. So you can put my email up there, and anybody anybody can uh, email me. I'm, I'm fairly, and they can go to my website. But I I have a book that came out. Um, but I mean, the more interesting book for the non-specialist is probably my Gifts of Athena book. It's not an easy book, but it is uh, it is about sort of the historical origins of the knowledge economy. 
And that's, that's, that's been out for, for about a decade. Okay. Hey, Joel, listen, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw that article and I was like, oh, I got to have him on. I, and I'm going to have to talk to Bob, too. I'm going to have to see if I can get him on and, and, and get him to play devil's advocate a little bit. So. Well, I wish you luck. Enough said. Enough said. Hey, it was my pleasure and I appreciate okay, you taking the time Mike, today. All the best. Enjoy Saigon. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.